So we're a clinical stage company, phase one company, that's leveraging our expertise in viral vectors and ex vivo cell processing to build a leading fully integrated cell and gene therapy company. This is a snapshot of Mustang. Our lead program is a potentially transformational ex vivo lentiviral gene therapy program for ex-skid licensed from St. Jude. Uh, it's in a multi-center trial in babies under the age of two that have not yet received a hematopoietic stem cell transplant with uh, other centers being um, UCSF and Seattle Children's. And it's also in a single center trial in patients that are failing a hematopoietic stem cell transplant with Harry Malik at the NIH. We anticipate NDA filing for this program in the first half of uh, 2022. We also have six CAR-T programs licensed in from City of Hope and Fred Hutch, and we believe all of them have the potential to be first to market for their target. Four programs are in phase one, two of them have released clinical data already, and uh, one program will be starting under Mustang's IND in the fourth quarter of this year. And the NDA filing for that program is anticipated in 2023. Just to be clear, all of our programs start first in human trials at the licensors, at the parent institutions, and then at the appropriate time, the IND is either transferred to Mustang or we open our own IND, as the case may be from a regulatory perspective. We also have licensed in CRISPR-Cas9 technology from Harvard. Um, Chad Cowan is the lead collaborator, Beth Israel Deaconess, and that collaboration has been ongoing since the first quarter of this year. We have a 27,000 square foot cell processing and translational research facility. Uh, it's on the University of Massachusetts Medical School campus in Worcester. You can see it here. This is Biotech 4. We have the ground floor, and we've built out the first half already. The team is large and growing with an impressive array of experience in the cell and rare disease um, areas. And um, our collaborators are really, I think, top notch from City of Hope, Fred Hodge, Harvard, and most recently, St. Jude's. This is a pipeline, it's a rather busy slide. I want to call your attention at the top to the XGID program with the two trials that I outlined already. Next, we have six CAR-T programs, three in the heme space, which we are, I would say, devoting the most of our attention to, simply because of the relative risk compared to solid tumors, but we're heavily invested in the solid tumor space as well. On the left, you can see the bars for the trials that are under the licensor's INDs, either having started already or soon to start. And on the right, you can see trials that are anticipated under Mustang IND with stars to indicate the filing of those respective INDs. You can see a CD123 um, currently ongoing at City of Hope, CS1, for, uh, that's in, um, in AML and BPDCN, blastic plasma cytoid dendritic cell neoplasm. CS1 for multiple myeloma, CD20 for B cell malignancies, and then the solid tumor programs, IL-13 receptor alpha-2 for glioblastoma. Um, this is local regional therapy. It obviously could be applicable as well for other systemic uh, malignancies like pancreatic cancer. You see HER2 again for local regional therapy only for glioblastoma or for metastatic breast cancer to brain. And then PSCA will be starting next year, prostate stem cell antigen, mostly for pancreatic and uh, and, and, uh, and prostate cancer. So this is, the, this is how our space looks today. Again, half of the 20, 27,000 square feet have been built out. We have capacity, we believe, in the, in the entire space to manufacture through commercial launch. We have four clean rooms right now, labs, including 1,000 square feet dedicated towards translational research and office space. Despite the fact that we've only been, uh, I would say, working in the space for about a year and a half, and the space itself that you just saw has been open only since June, we have had people in plant both at Fred Hutch and at City of Hope. And these are some of the metrics that we've been able to develop over the past year, I would say, since we've had folks at these two institutions. Compared to unidentified companies and academic institutes, we think we, fare, we, we compare very favorably with respect to lower cost of raw materials, fewer FT hours, and shorter manufacturing team, uh, time. We're looking now at about a six-day time in plant with the usual seven-day QC release. From the perspective of milestones this year alone, we intend to, City of Hope, our partner, will be presenting a small update on the CD123 trial. We'll be treating the, they will be treating their first patients uh, with the HER2 and CS1, CS1 carts at City of Hope. We'll be expanding our team with the addition of a CMO very shortly. We'll be executing an additional licensing deal to further enhance our technology and pipeline. We'll be finalizing our cell processing facility to get ready to receive patient cells. We expect first patient again to be dosed at the end of Q119. And our first Mustang IND will be filed for a multi-center trial with four centers starting, uh, the filing will be in December of this year. 
So just a brief look at the XSKID program. So this leverages the talent of our team as well as of our manufacturing facility. It involves the ex vivo lentiviral <laughs> transduction of patients' own hematopoietic stem cells with a normal copy of the mutated gene. The process is quite analogous, as you can see from the, from the, the flow of cells on the right. They're quite analogous to the CAR-T process with harvesting of cells um, shipment. In this case, cells can actually be shipped frozen, which, which allows us to service uh, basically globally from our facility. Lentiviral vector transduction of the cells, a two-day incubation period, shipment back to the patient. The patient gets treated with a low dose of, of busulfan, a non-myeloblative dose of busulfan, which is a chemotherapeutic agent, and the cells are reinfused. The vector encodes the normal IL-2 receptor gamma gene, and most importantly, from our perspective, from a CMC perspective, it's produced from a proprietary stable lentivirus producer cell line at St. Jude, and that, as far as we understand it, is unique in the industry. From a preclinical safety perspective, because of various innovations that have been developed at, by Brian Sorrentino at St. Jude, we think that the, um, the, the chances of leukemogenesis and sertial mutagenesis are extremely low, and in fact, we haven't seen that in the patients treated so far, of whom 13 have been published, eight by St. Jude and five by NIH. And this is, a, uh, if, you, if you recognize the structure here, you can see the EF1 alpha promoter um, is important to, to the safety profile, and the insulating uh, elements on either side are also quite, quite significant. This is a schema of the actual, um, of, of the actual uh, comma gamma chain. So the comma gamma chain is a component of multiple interleukin receptors, and to collectively these interleukin receptors are responsible for signal transduction that leads to eventually to normal uh, lymphoid cells. With that mutation, which is an X-linked mutation, so obviously most of the children are, are, most of the babies are boys. With that mutation, there are, you get essentially no B cells, no T cells, no NK cells, and you get B cells that do not produce antibody. Most patients are, are diagnosed in the end from three to six months, and all patients will die of their disease unless treated with definitive therapy. Today is hematopoietic stem cell therapy. There is a reservoir of patients, however, that get treated with hematopoietic stem cell therapy and deteriorate afterwards, and those are the subjects of the patients that are being treated at the NIH by Dr. Harry Malik. So what happens to patients that get transplanted? Well, if you see the top on the right there, you see the MSD, the matched sibling donors. Those patients do quite well. Unfortunately, only about 10% of patients do have a matched sibling donor um, for, their, for their graft. The rest of the patients have an overall survival rate of about 60 to 75 percent, and the quality of life deteriorates over time with graft-versus-host disease, decreasing T cell immunity, leading to infections and diarrhea. These patients get protein-losing enteropathy. 26 percent require uh, second hematopoietic stem cell transplant due to poor T cell reconstitution, and 58 percent require lifelong uh, IVIG. This is a slide that was presented in a little bit of an abbreviated fashion at uh, ASGCT this year. It summarizes eight patients. Um, you can see the follow-up ranges from 21 months for the first patient that was treated to two months. The first patient was a complicated patient, released from the hospital only after two years, but did have a complete reconstitution of his immune system and overall did extremely well. Did require, however, a boost. So that is a little bit of a bracketed patient, but again, did quite well. The other patients you can see are either at home and have completed the journey to, uh, from, from complete immunocompromised state to immune reconstitution. They have received their vac childhood vaccinations, their off-skid precautions, or their, as you see at the bottom there, patients that are simply doing well and too early for follow-up. Snapshot of restoration of T cells, restoration of B cell immunity. The one patient that was the outlier that required the boost is broken out at the bottom. Patient number one, you could see the patient did quite well with respect to T cell reconstitution following the boost. On the bottom right, you can see um, some suggestion that this is not a therapy that is going to lead to um, insertion of mutagenesis or leukemias with a demonstration, a fairly effective demonstration of polyclonal vector insertion site distribution. Just moving on quickly in the last couple of minutes to the CAR-T program, I can't do justice to six programs uh, in three minutes, but I will try. This is the uh, CD123. It's a um, murine SCFE, a proprietary spacer linker, and a CD28 costim. This, trial, this, this, uh, this uh, construct is in a trial with AML, as I mentioned earlier, as well as BPDCN. BPDCN arm was added later, and hence the dose level right now is lower. 
snapshot of patients, seven patients who were summarized by Elizabeth Buddy at the um, ASH meeting last year in an oral presentation. The top two were treated at the 50 million cell dose level. The next four treated at the 200 million target cell dose level. You see one patient did not achieve that. And the last patient at the bottom was a BPDCN patient. Overall, you see three responses. All patients were brought to, um, to allogeneic stem cell transplant. At the bottom, the BPDCN patient was a patient that had progressed through SL401, which is a fusion toxin targeting CD123. So importantly, the patient continued to express CD123 despite prior pretreatment. And in all patients screened, that has so far been the case. And the patient achieved a complete remission from a safety profile, the maximum CRS cytokine release syndrome was grade two, maximum neurotox was grade two, overall some uh, cytopenias that you might expect from the nature of the patient's disease, and uh, no myeloablation. This is just a case report from the England Journal of Medicine in 2016 from the IL-13 receptor alpha-2 uh, card directed uh, for GBM. This is a patient that if you can follow the, the light curves there, a patient that was treated into the cavitary where the neurosurgeon had resected the patient's recurrent glioblastoma. And what you can see is the patient frankly progressed through that therapy. In an innovative uh, turn to this therapy, the, the investigator asked on a compassionate use basis to infuse the cells into the cerebral spinal fluid. And he did, and in fact, what you see is the patient eventually achieved a complete response. All lesions, both intracranially as well as in the spinal canal, disappeared. It was a CR that lasted seven and a half months, and the new lesion that was biopsied had uh, antigen escape of the IL-13 receptor alpha-2 antigen. So, this um, response has not been duplicated, but a number of uh, lessons were learned from this. One, in terms of T cell selection, um, the route of administration, this dual route of administration, appears to be quite uh, important. And third, this is a patient that had a very hot tumor. And so, in the future, one of our foci is going to be to try to make tumors hot. Uh, and we have a number of ways that I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with uh, on trying to do that. And those will be parallel phase 1B trials at City of Hope as well as under RIND at Mustang. Just coming down to the end, I think differentiation of our cars is going to be critical for long-term success. We have a number of, of approaches that we're taking to do that. And with that, I'll close. Thank you.